So just one word on our gospel before we speak about uh, St. John Paul II. Uh, obviously, when Jesus is saying, uh, do you suppose that I am here to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. The Lord isn't saying, I have come to bring division in the sense of I want there to be division. Uh, but he knows that because of what he teaches, there will be division. Right? Because he teaches the truth, some will accept it and some won't. So it's not God's will that there be division. God wants that we be one, as he, as he prays in, his, uh, in, in John uh, chapter 17. Uh, that discourse, uh, that prayer to the Heavenly Father, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, uh, where he, he will, wishes that we be one as you and I, Father, are one. So God wishes that we be one. He doesn't want division, but he knows a division will happen because of, of his mission, because of his preaching, because of what he stands for, because simply not everyone wants the truth, not everyone wants the light, not everyone wants grace, not everyone wants heaven. So he knows that this will be a, a consequence, but not a, not a desired consequence. Okay, good. Just so that's clear before we move on, in case anyone else is reading the gospel there at home thinking, my goodness, there was me thinking Jesus was nice. Uh, he, he is, and Jesus wants unity, uh, just so we understand that correctly. Okay, so St. John Paul II, um, is, is an exceptional, an exceptional saint uh, and an absolutely wonderful Pope. Uh, for many of us, even if I'm not paying attention uh, when, I, when I'm praying, if I, I, I'm, it does sometimes come to mind, you know, when during the Eucharistic prayer we pray for our, our Pope, John Paul Francis. Uh, it's just for so long, for so long, during all of my youth, right, it was Pope John Paul. It was Pope John Paul from 1978 uh, until 2004, wasn't it? Uh, wasn't it? Six? 2006. Five. Early 2000s. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, an absolutely uh, prolific writer. So many international visits. Um, and, and such a kind of following the probably the, the approach set about by John the Twenty Third, this this idea of kind of opening the church without changing its teachings, you know, making the church welcoming and, and engaging with the modern world, and yet at the same time without compromising what the church actually teaches. So it's a, a delicate balance which uh, the Second Vatican Council set about uh, achieving, and John Paul II really uh, personified it. Just the way he would speak about relationships to sexuality, the way he would speak about interreligious dialogue, the way he would engage with <clears throat> members of other faiths was all so delicately balanced, well done, uh, faithful to what we believe, uh, convinced of, of the need for missionary activity and for the need mm -hmm. to, to get out there and, and spread the gospel and to witness to it. So just very briefly, today we can look at uh, the five loves of of. St. John Paul II, this is based on, if you have the chance, uh, Jason Everett wrote a wonderful book uh, summarizing his life based on, on, on his five loves. And I think he does a, a wonderful job in encapsulating uh, the, uh, the heart of the, the, the wonderful saint the, the, uh, who will probably be called John Paul II, John Paul the Great, St. John Paul the Great in time. But anyway, so one of his greatest loves was young people. Uh, when he was a, a professor, uh, he, he loved not just teaching young people, but being with young people. And in his youth groups, he would go kayaking with them in the rivers in Poland and then pull up the kayak somewhere and celebrate mass on the bank with them and sing their songs and always was so priestly, like with them as a father. He loved, he loved young people. So when he became a Pope then in 1978 and uh, he begins his discourses on the theology of the body, those 129 uh, Wednesday audiences where he starts to, I'm not sure, there was probably a plan in his mind. He was a genius. So more than likely there was a, a, a plan, but the way it came together afterwards, the way it was developed afterwards into what we now know as the theology of the body. Again, it's so, it's so practical. It's not like a, it's not like a, a theology of, of the body that, that's all kind of mystical and kind of way up there. It has everything to do with our feelings and our emotions and our bodies and how God has created them as, as, as a good thing, you know, in order to give us the ability to give the gift of self to another person and to receive the gift of self from another person. So just, just a really beautiful, but it shows how in touch he was 
with young people, with the reality of, you know, I have these feelings, I have these desires, what am I supposed to do with them? How do we see these as holy or how do we sanctify them? Why did God give them to us in the first place? These kind of really practical questions about relationships and sexuality. John Paul II was just a, a master in, in that department. And I would say a lot of that comes from or came from his, the, his time spent with young people and, and his, his time spent talking to them about these issues. Uh, in 1985 then he starts the World Youth Days and there was no Bon Jovi concert or no, what do you like, I don't know, Little Mix or whatever they're called. Uh, there was no concert ever in the world, not even Woodstock, that even came close to the kind of numbers that would gather for a World Youth Day. Ever. Like there was ne never a concert bigger than a World Youth Day. Never. So it's just uh, like they, they were incredible. People would gather from all around, whether it was in, in Denver or Rome, the only one that I was at, and it was in Poland and where else, Madrid since, and a few others, uh, Germany, uh, Cologne. And huge, huge crowds would gather to see the Pope. The Pope. Like, the Pope, it's, you know, no big stage with flashy lights and stuff, just, it's the Pope, the leader of the Catholic Church, and sometimes millions of people would gather, just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I remember the first time I saw him, I was in St. Peter's Square, and he was up at the, in front of the, the, the facade there uh, in, in, in St. Peter's Square, he was about yay high, I'd say. He was a tiny little white dot on the horizon over the sea of people, and even in that, at that distance, I was... I was struck by his sanctity. At that stage, he had been uh, very much debilitated by, by old age and by Parkinson's. Um, so I, I, I had learned Italian by that stage, but I couldn't understand a word he said. He was very difficult to understand by the time I got to the seminary. Just because of the, the Parkinson's, he, he, he slurred a lot, so it was very difficult to understand him. And yet, the sanctity of the man just emanated from him. He was really, really a, a man who knew how to love. Uh, his second uh, love was, was what we could call human love. That's what Jason Everett calls human love. Again, back to that, that theology of the body and the understanding of, of us as, as being created to be in relationship. God has created us in his image and likeness. And God in himself is a community. Right? God is a trinity. God is a family. So in and of himself, he is community. We're created in God's image and likeness. So we long for community. We're created for community for friendship, for family, for love, for self-donation. And so these, these desires that, that, that are given to us in and of themselves are good if they're used in the right way. Right? So we're, we're created for communion. We're created for communion. That's, that's, that's a good thing. So again, the way he spoke about uh, human love was, was um, not maybe not necessarily revolutionary, but definitely uh, modernized in, in its language. And... Uh, and very, very relevant. I think it's a treasure that will be discovered um, by the whole church as time goes on, because it really is, is so necessary for us to have a clear understanding of, of the, the theology of the body. Uh, his third love is the Eucharist, not necessarily in order, but not in hierarchical order, but the Eucharist. Uh, he celebrated Mass so beautifully. He prayed. He got up so early. He, uh, he had a kind of a a radar, almost, for the Eucharist, right? There are stories told of um, those who would organize this program, uh, in, including the former Bishop of Cloyne, uh, Bishop John McGee. They'd be trying to arrange this program and keep him on schedule, right? So it used to be here by 4 o'clock, then we have a 20-minute address with the local nuncio, whatever it is, and then we head off and we've got a meeting at, another meeting at 5, so, you know, you have to keep things going, and it's your job as his secretary or his entourage, just, mm -mm. you know, you, you can't be blessing children for tw half an hour. You just, there isn't time, right? <laughs> Give him one big blessing and, a head, and away you head. So they had to try and keep him moving through things. But he, was, he just loved being with people, uh, and he loved the Eucharist. So on one particular occasion, he was, he was in the States, and they were trying to guide him through the seminary to address the seminarians. And uh, so they made, the, one of the, the priests said, look, close the door to the oratory, Make sure it remains closed, because if he sees it's an oratory, he'll go in, and who knows how late we'll be, <laughs> right? So, mum's the word, close the door to the oratory, and they're walking down the corridor, and, um, and he just looks, and then he looks at the, the, the uh, person organizing his program and goes, <laughs> and, 
and in he goes. <laughs> you know, he just had this love for the Eucharist. He just wants to be with the Lord. You know, and this was a real passion of his, the Eucharistic Lord. You know, and even like you, you'll see the pictures of, of towards the end of his papacy when he's got such a stoop and he just holds up the host like that, can barely get it up to the height of his head and with quite a tremble in his hand, you know. Just, again, such a profound love for the Lord. Uh, one of his greatest loves, along with the Eucharist, is our Blessed Lady. At the age of eight, he lost his own mother. And at the age of 20, he had lost his father and his brother, Edmund, who uh, had become his older brother, who had become a doctor and had treated patients with scarlet fever, had contracted it himself and had died. So at the age of 20, he had lost everyone. He was, he was an orphan and uh, all of his siblings had passed away. That was it, just him. Then does the Nazi invasion of Poland like decimated the country. Uh, they had rooted out the faith, shot priests, they had gathered up the men, um, sent them off to concentration camps in order to escape deportation to Germany. He was working in a quarry. And so again, this is, I think in, in a divine providence kind of way, uh, this helped him to work with men, beaten rocks, also in the middle of winter, and you've probably never been to Poland in the middle of winter, but it's, Baltic isn't the word, right? Just absolutely, like minus 10, minus 15 uh, kind of thing. Those in Slovakia would probably know what I'm talking about. It's probably something similar there. Uh, but uh, absolutely freezing. So you're out there, like you've got a sledge and you're breaking rocks. So he would actually have to coat his, his face with what we call um, Vaseline, petroleum jelly, to stop it freezing, you know, so you've had some gloves. And, anyway, but then he, he, would get, he was talking to men all the time and getting used to kind of men's questions and men's issues. He was a manly man, you know? There's a picture of him, actually, uh, uh, in, in the quarry with no T-shirt on because it's a Polish summer, so he goes from one extreme to the other, quite hot in the summer, and there he is with his brown scapular hanging out, you know? And, uh, but just, he, he would talk to the men, and the men would talk to him, so he's getting used to being with people. So his, his theology and his, his very, very keen mind is still very rooted in the practicalities of, of, of real life and people's real issues. Uh, so he got knocked down by a tram and knocked down by a, a Nazi truck. There you go. Survived them both. And that, along with a divinely orchestrated encounter with a man named Jan Tiranowski, who introduced him to the Carmelite spirituality, this kind of sparks off a desire in him to be a priest. So all of this kind of practical knowledge that, that he had acquired and all of the hatred that he had witnessed, all of the pain, all of the suffering from the, the Nazi invasion of Poland, all of this coming, in, coming together forms within him this, this desire to be a priest. God was calling him and God was forming him. And so he had to be formed uh, uh, in, a, in a hidden fashion and ordained and then goes and he teaches then in Krakow in the university. And because of his very, as I say, keen mind uh, and his, his, his wisdom very quickly, again, without looking for it. In fact, if anything, um, he had a tendency to be a bit rough on the edges as in he'd arrive with unpolished shoes because he had happened to be kayaking with his young people beforehand and he'd arrived in you know into the bishop's palace and you know trying to make sure his cassock was just a bit lower so you wouldn't see the shoes and that kind of thing uh, you know just despite despite <laughs> despite that uh, he was promoted became bishop archbishop and finally cardinal and then elected as pope in 1978 his great love for our lady led him then to take on the motto totus to us, totally yours, from the spirituality of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. And so, even in his... Uh, Christ, you, know, you see the M for Our Lady. So totally yours, totally uh, dedicated to Our Lady. Having lost his mom at the age of, of eight, he took on Our Lady in a very, very particular way. Wrote, wrote beautifully about her. And after the attempted assassination on his life where... Uh, Ali Acha, in the crowd in front of St. Peter's, shot him twice. One bullet grazed his thumb and the other went in under 
uh, his abdomen, which should have led to internal bleeding. And as the surgeon said, this, this is impossible. The bullet, you know, bullets, just for those who don't, might not know, bullets go in a straight, more or less a straight line, okay? Uh, but this went into him and went around the vital organs. You can't bend a bullet around vital organs. It doesn't do that. Uh, but it went around, because normally if it goes through your liver, you'll, you'll bleed out. Um, but it went around all the vital, or, vital organs. And he said, John Paul II is quoted as having said, one hand pull the trigger, another hand guided the bullet. And so he attributes his survival uh, of that ass attempted assassination in, in 81, on the 13th of May, to Our Lady. And so afterwards then consecrates the world to her in 82 and again in 84. <clears throat> so he had a great love for Our Lady and great belief in, in her power and in, in the, the power of, of, of the consecration of the world to her. Towards the end of his life, his last love, one could say, was the cross. And he suffered greatly, and I'm not sure if, if you've seen the images, but there, there are plenty of them, of uh, some of his last addresses from the window in the papal apartments there, it's the second last window, uh, in the papal apartments where the Pope would come out and address people on Wednesdays. And on one particular, it was towards the end of his life, on one particular Wednesday he came out and you, got, you couldn't understand a word. It was, it was just croaking, basically. Um, and probably one of the most eloquent speeches he ever gave in his entire life. Because he witnessed by his weakness the power of suffering. So through his, you know, imagine like if you're a public figure and you're coming out and you know that there are thousands of cameras down there, TV cameras, and you can't even speak. And so he came out and all you can hear is, because uh, he had a tract oscopy. So uh, he could hardly speak, like physically it must have been desperately painful, but you couldn't understand what he was saying. But he witnessed then like to every, I'm just thinking of like of every old person or invalid around the world who is bedridden and who feels like their life is useless and feels like it, it serves no purpose to be this way. Why should I even be here, especially considering the, the, con the, the discussion going, going on today now around euthanasia. And he shows that every life is valuable and every suffering offered up out of love is transformative. Just an absolutely incredible witness in so many ways because if ever you read stories about saints and it says how intelligent they were and how many books they wrote, to be honest, that never really impresses me. Grand, okay, so he wrote books, whoopee-doo. Um, but that's, that's not, we don't get into heaven because of what we know. We don't get into heaven because of how many books we wrote. We get into heaven because of what we do. It's, it's actions that count. What we do with our time, not how much we know. Knowing stuff is easy, doing stuff, applying that knowledge into my life, renouncing my will in order to do what I know, that's very, very different. And that's what he did. So it's not just the fact that he was incredibly intelligent uh, and knew, knew 18 languages and used nine of them proficiently during his pontificate, those kind of things. They're, they're nice little things to know, but, um, but that's not what, what made him a great saint. He strongly believed in the need for us all, especially us young people, us young people, uh, at the time, to imitate the lives of saints. And so during his pontificate, he canonized 480, I think it's 486 saints throughout his pontificate, more than all of the saints before him had canonized for five centuries. So more in one pontificate than in 500 years. Because he said, we need saints. We need, you know, we need, like, th these are models, people we, people we can imitate. So you've got married men, married women, priests, religious, laity, you know, everyone needs models to, 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 to emulate. He then himself was canonized on Divine Mercy Sunday, which I think if he had had a choice, uh, is exactly the Sunday he would have chosen. Not just because he was Polish, because the, the Divine Mercy uh, image, the Divine Mercy devotion isn't a Polish devotion. This is for the Universal Church. It's a treasure for the Universal Church. And so after giving us St. Faustina as the saint and recognizing the devotion to the Divine Mercy in the Universal Church, he then was canonized on that very feast day in 2014. So we thank the good Lord for such a wonderful example 
of sanctity, of papacy, of, of practical theology, of wisdom, of love for Our Lady, of, of priesthood. We thank the good Lord for the many ways that the Church has been blessed through St. John Paul II. And we pray for the Church throughout the world today. We pray for all of the difficulties that it's undergoing and for the, the divisions and factions and all this. Lord, that they may be one as you and the Heavenly Father are one. Amen. <laughs>